Hey everybody, my name is Chase Pipes and you're watching Chasing History and we are off on an epic cross-country adventure with Seven Ages Audio Journal and we are exploring prehistoric Native American mound complexes and we, you, <laughs> are at the coolest site! We are at Moundville, Alabama, and this is probably one of the more impressive sites that existed, right? Pretty much. I think so. Yeah. We are with Rosa Hall, who's a 30-year veteran of a being a site interpreter here at Moundville State Park. Rosa, what's kind of the general history of this site? Well, when the when they began to settle here, of course they came to this site because of the the um, Warrior River, or we call it the Black Warrior River now, but this river, and they built up here on this bluff. This never floods here. Okay. They won't, they won't flood what's behind us, um, and there's lots and lots of resources here. We're just below the fall lines, and so there's a lot of different um, things that are going on with the geology, but of course they pick it because it's high. Okay. It's not going to flood. The river on the across the river uh, where every spring the floods deposit all this nice dirt and rich minerals and things and then that's where the gardens the main gardens for for Malvo were grown okay so before we get into that what 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 groups of prehistoric Native Americans are here is this the Mississippian they're period? Mississippian they're, okay and that was what's kind of roughly the time frame of that era they're, they begin here about um, in the 1300s. Okay. And the woodland period is is dying out. Okay. Um, and that was the the time period a little bit before them. Mississippians are known for the building of mounds, although woodlands built mounds, but they were specific for uh, burial. Okay. Where these mounds, not all of them were. They're, okay. They're used used differently. So this is a good site. They could still have gardens on this side as they grew that they eventually go across. But um, so this is the landing of them for whatever reason. Uh, we're not sure where they were coming from, but as a woodland period dies down, people start moving. Okay. Finding another place where they can, they know they can, as today we'd call it make a living or right have a yeah <laughs> this is one of these you know mississippian period was the the artistic and cultural height of native america you know on the landscape before european contact and this site is one of the most impressive sites of any within the mississippi river drainage which is why we're here and bringing you here because it's <laughs> awesome this is a site where they built mounds but specifically they built mounds that platform mounds where you know a paramount chieftain or leaders would sit where worshiping would happen and this site is a wonderful site to pick to make a living as you were talking because of the geology so geologically why are they choosing this site? We've got this bluff up against the river and a floodplain. Is that why? It has a lot to do with it, but we're because we're just below the fall line. Now, what fall line? This is the coastal. This is where the coastal plain. Okay. As as it, excuse me, the fall line cuts across, and as rivers and everything are coming out of the the Cumberland Plateau. Okay. They're being held uh, by hard mint rocks and minerals to be straight and they mm -hmm. and rivers don't want to be straight right. they want they want to to flow the way they want to flow yeah. when they get to the coastal plain which is the the ending of this hard rock uh, um, time period the uh, the, it, the river starts grow, going and it and it's curving okay and it so it's it's wanting to do what it wants to do but because of that it is now building up um, soil and everything on the other side so the gardens could go over there okay so it's got it, it has access to the Cumberland Plateau mm -hmm. where you have you know nuts and hardwoods and, and game to hunt and also access to this coastal plain where you have this meandering river that's depositing 
silts and sediments that's great to rejuvenate the land for agriculture, which is really starting to be prevalent during this period. And this is an important thing. Everything changed at those fall lines. Okay. The river changes. The plants change. The minerals change. Everything changed. Even the plants change. Oh, wow. Uh, and so we're kind of just a little below it. And so we still have a lot of the things that you see in, um, above it. But um, that's why they, they came. This is why they settled. They have a source still of minerals in, um, uh, uh, right there at the fall lines with sandstone. And you'll see a lot of things here in the museum that are made from sandstone. A rattlesnake disc mm -hmm. uh, is sandstone, and it comes from Tuscaloosa. But it had to be brought here. Right. And, um, and so other s sandstones are found in other sites that d were used, but they had to be traded. Right. So uh, you're close to a source of minerals, and so you use it. Okay. So if, if you were a native population and you had just about the choice of any spot on the landscape in this vicinity to settle, for what your, what your technology that you had and the types of agriculture that you did and the way you lived, mm -hmm. this was the choice spot yes. of anything in the area. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why they're here, is because of that. The access to the river. Access to the river. What, the, the food that's in the river, the, the lay of the land, you're close to it so you can actually, you know, use the water. Yeah. Um, and so this was a great place. And that's why they stayed here for when they did. The woodland, the end of the woodland is when really corn gets introduced. Mm -hmm. And so it, it really takes off in the Mississippian time period. And now that it really takes off, they need much larger areas in order to cultivate that crop yes. to feed a bigger population. Mm -hmm. So they need to look for places where they have access to the game and the fish and uh, the nuts and stuff of something like the Cumberland Plateau and the agriculture that's really easy to do down here in the coastal plain. Yeah, we're also, we're fall lines, the next, next geologic term of the fall lines um, is the black belt mm -hmm. and then it's the coastal plain. Okay. So I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. We, the, we're, we want to get it right. But, yeah, but the um, uh, black belt and its underlying soil uh, is beginning on the far side. You're be beginning to get a change um, in what's going on. Okay. And so as you go further south, it definitely changes, but you don't have to go very far right. before trees change. The dominant trees are, are cedars down there. And so you notice it quick like that. Oh, this, these are different. That's so fascinating that you've got that, that change between these geological mm -hmm. zones and the mm -hmm. flora and the fauna. That's mm -hmm. just, that's mind blowing. This is definitely a choice place to live. Uh, not only that, but it's got a commanding view of the river. You're high out of the floodplains. You've got access to everything that you need in order to survive. So now that we know why, uh, they were settled here. Let's go look at what they did, what they created, and the structure of this site. Okay. You ready? Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's go see it. We were on top of Mound E here at the Moundville site, and this was one of the very first mounds that were constructed, correct? Yes, we believe so. Okay. Um, uh, as a leave the riverbank area, um, we believe that this is where they started. This okay. is the beginning of these mounds that are, that are that will eventually be built here. Okay, now there were some earlier mounds built here during the woodland period, correct? Mm -hmm. And so you didn't have continuous occupation from the mounds that were built during the woodland period through, at least not a, in a massive city form, I guess you could say, uh, through the mounds that were built here at Moundville during its height, the mounds that we see in the background. No, uh, what well, we believe there, there was a woodland mound that it was, um, where it was, was almost completely destroyed by farming. And so we, we lose that. Mm -hmm. So uh, this site, after the natives leave and, and people start to come, 
uh, this was farmed. There was crops on top of these. Um, we have black and white photographs that we can show people what, you know, what, what it looked like. And so with corn and cotton, highly, highly um, agriculture being done, eroding of the sides. Um, and so some damage was done during that time period. And that's more than likely when this one, a lot of mounds were missed. It just, oh, there's a bunch of dirt right there. Let's fill in a hole over yeah. there. Yeah. And so a lot of things like that uh, got done. But we believe that this is the beginning of the building of the mounds, choosing this site and then starting to work on the on the plaza area. Okay, so you've got to start somewhere and this is the starting point for the for the the later mound builders that would build the main series of mm -hmm. mounds that you start. So after they built this mound, uh, how how long a time went on before they started building other mounds and setting up the structure? How long was this here for before everything else got started? I'm I'm going to I'm going to I'm not a, I'm not 100% sure on okay. that how long they how long they it took a while to do this and the population was small so they ha their that is going to be grown and then as it gets bigger and bigger because of the nature of this site uh, people are coming here uh, from from all around and being a part of this so um, it probably took a while before you had enough people to continue the mound mound building. But we do know fairly early on is they start working on the plaza okay. that's behind us. Um, uh, it's not an artificial plaza, but they uh, smoothed it out by filling in holes uh, and and things like that. Uh, as Making the ground level. Level. Yeah. Now this is, uh, there were no grasses here. Mm -hmm. It was all hard packed. Um, earth. Earth. All, all the mounds, all the plaza, everything was. Uh, but, um, That's a fascinating note because when we look at these mounds today, we see the grass on them and we assume that that's how they were in prehistory when in fact, the foot traffic that was on it and the care that was taken for these sites, you know, they would have been completely bare. Just like at mounds that we visited, like at uh, Poverty Point, would have had different colors of soil, uh, and there's no point of putting different colors of soil on a place if you intend to cover it up with grass. So these mounds would have been completely bared and maintained so they wouldn't erode. Yes, except for bushy native grasses, mm -hmm. all of these grasses are imported yeah. here. Uh, to the United States. They come from other places. And see, that's a fascinating thing about sites uh, anywhere that you go to. You know, you see a whole bunch of mounds all in one place and you're like, oh wow, that was all brought in and built at one time and then people left. And that's not necessarily how it goes. You have phases of occupation and phases where populations disperse. And what's fascinating about this site is, is you have a woodland population that was here who constructed mounds. They slowly faded, slowly dispersed to where the site was fairly abandoned, but not entirely. Then you have another group coming Come in uh, and want to construct mounds. Now that idea of building uh, of, of building mounds on this site, because this site was when the 1300s is when it was built. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, yeah and, and going from there. And going from there. And you know, you had uh, a, a I wouldn't say a Cahokian influence, but there was an influence of mounds being mm -hmm. built during this time mm -hmm. all over the place. All over the southeast. Yeah. Uh, we're building mounds. Maybe one or two at some sites as these groups are beginning to to travel to... Well, we don't know. You know, they did not leave a written record. That's why they're called prehistoric. But they left a... a they did leave a record and we have to interpret what what that is. What was left. What was left. And these were built over time. So they built it up, capped it off, probably lived on it, and then the next phase comes. And we believe that was what happens when, when we go to Mound B. Um, so it's kind of like a layer cake. Yeah. Uh, the only, only ones that aren't c constructed that way seems to be the ones on the, on the, on the far side of the plaza. They seem to have been done almost at the same time. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, maybe, you know, and when I say almost, it wasn't like 10 weeks. It was, it, it took time, but it seemed like they were all done 
relatively at, at the same. Yeah, time. instead of the ones that are on the, on the on this side, which are older. Okay. Okay. So coming out of the woodland period, towards the end of the the Cahokian phase of influence, you start seeing this site be ha inhabited and mounds being constructed. And that's something we're going to explore now is we are going to go and check out all of these other incredible mounds that are around this site. You ready? Let's go. We're standing out in front of Mound B on the site, and this is the largest mound that was built on the site, correct? Yes, it's the tallest. It's the tallest. Tell us the purpose of this mound, because this, this was built once we, once we have mounds started to be constructing here on site and people are going to live here throughout, you've got this massive mound that is constructed. Mm -hmm. So what's the purpose of this mound? Um, of course, again, we don't know 100% sure, but what, we, what archaeologists believe and anthropologists is they began building it up and it was for someone, today we'd call him a chief. Um, I've heard the term sun god, but we don't know what they were being called. But who, someone of great importance that was a leader and he would live here and also be involved with certain ceremonies. Possibly by the time he died, his home, this on top, would be burnt and then they would add to it. Okay. Packing it down, basket by basket, um, and it, it, it's easier than you think because they've, they've tried to replicate that. Some archaeologists did somewhere and had everybody bring a basket, and by the end of the day, <laughs> they had a pretty good sized mound. So wow. You got to have somebody stomping it down and everything. So we believe that they burned it, and then they added to it and built it up until it got, it got to this size, possibly about 25 years 30 in between. Okay. Um, it's so the one general of the things I've heard is a lifespan of whoever. Right, exactly. A general lifespan mm -hmm. uh, of, of a leader. Because mm -hmm. age, uh, most people lived into the, what, their 40s? That was about the extended age of an individual? Mm, not, not quite that far. Not quite that no, far. Okay, they, so late 30s, early 40s. Um, even probably late 20s and mid 30s. Okay. Um, one, one of the things is because the diet has changed when corn's introduced. Okay. Corn is high in sugar. So now you're eating a lot of sugar and decay sits in with um, with your teeth or abscesses. Ah, okay. And so um, even though it's good and it's, it's supplying everybody with things, you still didn't have what you needed, but, but the teeth tell a story. It's destructive to your teeth. So this mm -hmm. brand new diet that was brought in uh, with corn being a prevalent staple, mm -hmm. uh, adversely affected their teeth, which changed their lifespan. Probably so, but but this is hard work. Right. I mean, you know, someone's clearing trees. Someone is using those to build a palisade wall. Someone is is directing building this mound. Uh, someone is um, they're fishing. Or it, it's a hard life mm -hmm. that you. You can't just say, "Well, this month I'm not going to do anything." You had to participate. You had to to survive. Right. And so this was hard, hard labor, and um, so the lifespan uh, was was not quite as long. Okay. You know, we they weren't ancient. You know, uh, so maybe 25 ending of that to late 30s, mid 30s. Okay. Uh, is mo what most uh, most people say. So. Um, the building of this and the and the building on top. One of the ceremonies is um, would have been what we call the green corn ceremony. So that's when the crop, the corn is up, the ears are there. You know you're going to have corn. It's not edible yet. It's not it, it's not edible yet, but you know you've made it. Mm -hmm. And um, the leader, the chief, would. Um, a test and say it's now ready then they would have a ceremony uh, a lot of fun and um, uh, the, the tribes that still practice green corn you eat a lot of food and you visit with everybody and so it's an important thing and then later all of your house would have been cleaned mm -hmm. your bowls would have been broken um, and your fire would be put out and then the leader would put out the main fire, relight it, and you would go and, and get embers 
For your own fire. For your own oh. fire to take back. Okay. So we are one with the fire. Right. I mean, this connects you again. Yeah. With whatever, with whatever. So, so that would have been, and this plaza would have probably been full. Full of people. People that came from outside the Palisade Wall, who are still part of this group, and possibly up and down the river too. Okay, so let's get back to the mound I'm and sorry. the features that we have back here. So we've got a ramp feature going mm -hmm. up, and there's another ramp on the other side. How many ramps does this have? This one has two. This one has two. Yes. And I, well, I assume that, you know, the ramps were to gain access to mm -hmm. the top. Mm -hmm. Okay, how, who are, so the, the, the principal chieftain would have lived up top. Mm -hmm. And this is a feature that's common in Mississippian sites yes. to this period. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got this mound. What's going out in the plaza out beside us? Because we've got this massive plaza, mm -hmm. and that's another feature that's on the landscape that I think is really interesting. So we are going to change camera angles and show you how cool the plaza is. So right behind us, we have the main plaza, mm -hmm. which is basically the, the central focus of the entire site, correct? Mm -hmm. So what kind of things would have been going on here at the plaza? But, but first, how was this constructed? Because not, you know, everything is, you know, totally flat. They actually had to build this plaza up. Talk about that. Yes, uh, um, as they're building the mounds or between them, they this is a flat area, but it, it's got a lot of holes and dips, and, and, dips and things. And they, on purpose, uh, filled those up to flatten them out. Wow. To, uh, so that took a lot of labor also. Well, that shows the importance of this space. Mm -hmm. If they're taking the time to fill it up and level it all out, this, this is an important space for, mm -hmm. for, for them. Yeah. And so, it, uh, of course, again, you have to imagine it without grass. Yeah. And and filling it in. Now, um, that did take labor, but everybody more than likely produced, um, participated in this. What kind of things would have been done out here in the plaza? Would trade have gone on in the plaza? Would ceremony have gone on in the plaza? The, the trade part would probably not. The trading would be okay. either, uh, it would be out in front of Mount, it would okay. be out in front of Mount B. Uh, so the goods would be brought up the traders would come up from the river and, and prob we don't know, but we assume, we assume yeah. that it would be at the base of it. They would have their things to trade. And, and of course, the um, people, Mountville people had things to trade too. The traders, that's where they would be in their canoes parked down at the, <laughs> at the river. And so out here would be that when they would gather for the green corn ceremony, when they would gather for any other important ceremony that they had uh, but also they probably were they were still playing the game of stick ball okay which was very important um, it's also called little brother of war but you have to have a flat surface to play it on and um, that would have been something that that would have probably been going on out here so the plaza kind of would have worked like, a, I guess you could say, a modern day stadium would have, where you would have ceremonies being held there, uh, games being played there, people moving back and forth, mm -hmm. just a general use area, but an important general yes. use area. And there were houses here too. See, now that's something that's really fascinating about Moundville, as opposed to other uh, prehistoric Mississippian sites is, is in, in plazas and other sites, you don't see houses being, or buildings being constructed in the middle of the plaza, mm -hmm. but here you do, which is unusual. Is there any speculation on the reasoning behind that? No, I don't think so. I hadn't, that part I haven't heard, but, but the houses were not like, a subdivision out there right um, they seem to be placed near the palisade wall um, so they were here but they were not as in great abundance as possibly it's outside the plaza area um, so people of great importance for whatever they did and who they were are possibly honored by having a cop my people would have been <laughs> on the other side of the plaza <laughs> Uh, over there so but um, the we have found evidence of, of structures being held in, and of course most of them all have a you know a fire pit storage area uh, and so that is something that they're they're 
re addressing now is is these types of houses and what their uses and, were. And, well, if you can, if we can, if you can figure out what it was, was it just living? You know, was it a place that someone is making pottery, or is it a place um, where uh, uh, doing wood woodwork or uh, doing uh, stonework? Were these people housed differently? And that's a question that, that yeah. can be answered at some point uh, by what, what what they left behind. If you're doing flint napping, making stone tools. There's going to be debitage like all over down the there place. all over the place. Yeah. And if you're doing pottery, there's going to be evidence of the different types of pottery, mm -hmm. of the clay that is here uh, also. So it's very diagnostic mm -hmm. uh, on, on that part. It's such a cool thing to come to one of these sites where you, you know, see the temple mounds and then you see these flat areas that you know you really don't give much pay much attention to, but actually they were some of the most important parts of the site. It's where ceremonies would have been held. It's where games would have been played. It would have been the pivotal point for your everyday people that lived at this site to where they congregate, where they meet. This is such a fascinating site and there's more of it to see. So we're gonna go check out some of the other features that make Moundville a unique site. So one of the things that's important about any native site that you go to is, is that there is masses amount of trade going on. Uh, commerce from different parts of the country bring brought here to the site and that trade would have happened at the base of the mound that we're at right here. Probably so. Now, the top of the mound besides his his dwelling and where he lived, uh, around it, we believe, we cannot 100%, is that <clears throat> they possibly had done posts and there were carvings in them, maybe of the birds or something like that that would have, would have been uh, up. So as you approached from the river for this trade, you would go, hmm. <laughs> This, this place is different. So the trade goods that were brought were brought from the Gulf Coast with shells, big conch shells. How far are we from the Gulf Coast? Um, um, over a hundred miles? Yes, yes. Over a hundred yeah, miles, okay. Yes. Where, where else is, are things being brought in here? Um, some of the things are copper. Copper? We used, sometimes uh, in the past, archeologists thought the copper was coming probably from uh, the Michigan area. Yeah. But there has been a, an outcrop found um, in um, uh, western Georgia that possibly this is where it was coming from. See, that's fascinating because at the uh, Poverty Point site that we visited in a previous episode, uh, we discussed that, that that's what they're finding as well, is that the copper isn't coming from as far away as the Great Lakes, mm -hmm. but there's actually sources in the Southern Appalachians that copper is coming from. And see, that's the fascinating thing about archeology span is, is right when you think you know, right when you think you understand what's going on, some new evidence crops up that completely rewrites your understanding. And that's just what's fascinating about this subject. Mm -hmm. So we've got copper coming from possibly the Appalachians. What other kinds of materials are coming in? One of them is um, galena. Galena? Galena, okay. which is a lead ore. And um, it, it kind of it forms in these cubes. Very, very heavy. Yeah. So if you picked up a piece in my hand, you'd go. It, it almost drop it immediately. Uh, we think that this is being used for paint. Oh wow! Okay. Oh. Uh, so if you heat it, yeah. Yeah, that's if not you, such if a If you heat thing. Galena, you you get a white residue. Okay. And so uh, the the painting was possibly was being done by this uh, Galena substance, which definitely is coming from a long way away. Right. Uh, and and so shells, mussels. Um, other minerals, um, types of uh, rocks to do a uh, flint napping with or to make a point. Uh, we're kind of, we still have some good chert that can be used for that, but there's others that are better. Exotic harder. materials. Yeah, coming from somewhere else. And so uh, that some of those have been also found. So we know there was a trade with, with that and even within the southeast, but it still was coming from a great distance and um, coming by canoe. Canoe. And that, yeah. was the, that was the interstate. This river here was the interstate 
for travel. So you've got all of these tray materials that are coming from great distances away, stuff up from the Gulf of Mexico coming up, stuff from the Southern Appalachians bringing in, exotic flint materials for flint napping brought in. You've got all these exotic materials. What are they creating with these exotic materials? What 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 is their art look like? What does their pottery look like? Are there distinctive uh, iconography that in their art that is unique just to this site? Their pottery is fairly unique. Um, the the pottery was was a black. Um, color to it. Okay. And so you're using clay that's native here, uh, making a vessel. You're either keeping it uh, the way it is, you're not going to decorate it, but you're going to either incise or you're, you're going to um, uh, do something on the vessel. So they're carving designs onto the vessels. And it's, it's like when it's still moist enough to do that, it, it, if you're ever with clay, you have it steps. Like, yeah. You have to let it harden some, and then sometimes you can incise what, when it's hardened. Here, they also burnished, which you took a very smooth um, a pebble, and you would go over the surface of it, rubbing it and burnishing that clay. You're smoothing it out, even the design. And that gives it like a high polish? High, high polish for when it's fired. So your vessel's done. It, 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 it takes more than a day, but your vessel is done. Now you have to build a, a fire, a hot a hot fire, and you start turning these vessels around to warm them up, and then you get them closer and closer to the fire. But you're still turning them. Gradually turning up the the heat that that yeah. pottery vessel is exposed to. And then you put the vessels in the center of this red hot fire, and you let it sit there until it glows. Wow. Cherry. That's hot. Red. Wow. And that's the temperature they figured out. That was the temperature that they knew the pottery had, had reached its hardness, that it's now safe to pull it out and to use it. And so um, now you have to do this gradually, but you would bring it out from the center part of the wood and you would have a pile of pine straw or a pile of leaves and you would immediately take this and put it down in there covering it up smothering this vessel in this um, material and the first time i ever saw it i went you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that but you can and so it what it does is it 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 sucks into the the pottery this black burning smoke oh i'm gonna call it smoke fascinating uh, and it goes into the pot now when it is completely cool and you break it you can tell that it doesn't go very far into the clay into within the pot shards it, it it goes into it but it doesn't it doesn't go all the way through um i used to believe is when i was younger that the whole thing was black but that's not true and that's something that is unique to this site that type of that type of pottery making process where you've got these really black pots the, or to the general area the general area yeah. here mostly at Malville so we think this is these were elite things not, the common people didn't have that but, you know um, not any, everybody had that this was high I, I, I'm gonna say all, it was art but it was it was something high and special and so only the elite people, the people that are living on top, on, on, on top the, of the mounds. The, yeah. These, this is for that or for a certain ceremony, but they were special because there was regular party pottery found done the same way, but not blackened, yeah. blackened like this is. And so that is pretty diagnostic, and a lot of sites have that uh, using a clay that is different colors, uh, using. Um, Different pigments and ochres yes, and they, things like that. At wherever the sites of these of these uh, other sites were, but um, this seems to be something that's special here. Right, is that that type of black burnishing that mm -hmm. you see on the site, and that's something that's true with a lot of Mississippian period sites. Is is, is you tend to have a, especially large sites like this. They've kind of got something that makes them special, that makes them unique. That that is them uh like at uh spyro the ornately in carved shell uh shell um gor shell gorgets and conch shells how they're just the, that artistic style is unique 
just to Spyro. You know, shells engraved in other places, but not like at Spyro. You know, pottery is manufactured at other places, but not like at Moundville. Uh, I want to talk about the iconography for a second because there, there's a there's something that I saw on the water tower coming in, and it's on your shirt, and it seems to be repeated and repeated and repeated. It's almost like a logo for Moundville, and it's mm -hmm. this hand with rattlesnakes around it with an eye in the center. Now, that is a, a, a prehistoric Native American artwork that existed from this site, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And is that something that's unique to this site? That one is. That one is. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and when you see it at other sites, is it interpreted as being copied from Moundville? Like it originated from Moundville? I don't... I don't know of if you. I don't know of a site, other site that has that has it. So it's has just found here. Okay. I, I'm going to say more than possibly yes. Okay. There's another one, and because of of what we believe it was for, and there's other small um, sandstone, and this is made out of sandstone uh, pallets, um, also from here. So this one is uni is I is unique. It is uh, fairly large. It has intertwining snakes on it. The design on them is chevron, so uh, some naturalists think it was a um, canebrake rattlesnake. As opposed to a timber rattler or yeah. other species. Yeah, because it has a chevron pattern. See, I always thought that too. I always <laughs> thought it was a canebrake rattler. I, and and I'm, that's what I say. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but they're intertwining, and snakes will intertwine like when they're mating. But we don't, I don't think that's what this one means. And then surrounding it um, in the center is a hand with a, an opening in the middle, um, like an eye. And so a lot of people call it the hand and eye. Uh, this was found here. It was plowed up. Oh, gosh, you're kidding. And not broken. Wow. <laughs> so uh, uh, it, it was... The landowner kept it for a while, and then he went, well, I might have taken it to Dr. Smith at the Museum of Natural History. And that is where it was when uh, C.B. Moore came through, and he had to go up there to photograph it. So it's in his documentation. Uh, but it is our Alabama state artifact. It is on a lot of things that we have. Now, what does it mean? What, what does that hand mean? Well, there's cultures all over the world that have that use hands. Even even uh, paleo people in caves, they would blow a pigment right. uh, around the hand uh, in in caves that that are ancient. So this eye hand thing and eye thing is still in cultures all over the world. It didn't come from here. It's just something that the people noticed, saw, tried to look at and figure out what what this means a lot of anthropologists because of the the position of this site where it is um the stars here at night will blow you away and late summer uh when the milky way is just absolutely gorgeous this is the time that they believe the souls will travel into the other world on the Milky Way. Oh, cool. And some also say Scorpio is at its brightest then, and that red red color of Scorpio is a sign, possibly, that um, this is the time that the, the souls, so your soul is gonna stay with your remains until the time is right for you to travel. Kind of like a seed is planted and the mm -hmm. seed is there and then you have a plant that grows up out of that at the right time. Mm -hmm. When you're bought, when you die and your body goes into the ground, you, your soul waits until the right time when it ascends into the heavens. So you said soul and heavens and that, those are modern terms. Well, you're correct, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> so their, their belief is just there was something, there was something later, and because of the Milky Way, that it looks like a pathway, and so and since it's unreachable, that's when the the souls 
can, the remains can go and uh, uh, travel to to uh, to the next world. To the next world, and so because of that hand and eye, possibly that's what it means. People used to uh, say, you know, I am important. This is my symbol, uh, but. Most uh, anthropologists kind of agree about this this thing that um, would have been a way to travel, and so this is an important important on that disc, but that disc was used as a paint palette. Mm -hmm. So for a ceremony, an important ceremony, the I'm going to call it a medicine man, but someone of of that nature would have mixed the paints to paint. The, the leader, maybe his wife, uh, and this was used for the elite uh, to maybe to go to war. And so the remains on these, on these pallets uh, of minerals and things are another thing that tells us, you know, yeah. what was being used for, the, uh, for these types of painting uh, on them. Something that's incredible is the iconography that you see here at this site. It's unlike any place else in the world. And something that I'd like to bring up, I guess now is a great time, is the work that you guys do with the local native population. You guys do a lot of work in interpreting these with the legends and the, and the mythology of the native peoples that are alive today. Work, work very closely uh, with the... Um Oklahoma tribes mm -hmm. and the nations up there with their chiefs uh, and they're all of them Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, uh, all others too that were in the southeast and uh, stories are, are told almost identical to one group to the other there's always a twist maybe the rabbit is a trickster and the next one it may be the fox is a trickster but but these stories and symbols of uh, that are found on things, there seems to be um, stories that identify right. with this symbolism mm -hmm. and yeah. on, on that. And so t today's stories, today's symbolisms uh, that they that are modern tribes use um, are things that, that we know that were done. Now, are the stories coming from the Mississippians that were here? We can't say that because yeah. as they as they start to leave eventually, uh, they take these stories with them. Are these the modern day Creeks? Are these the modern day Chickasaw? Are they Choctaw? Um, those questions still are not completely answered. Yeah. But what's important to keep in mind about this site is, and really what makes this site shine mm -hmm. bright as a, a, a such a phenomenal place to go visit, is that work that the researchers here do with the current native populations and I find that incredibly admirable and something that you know should be your your blueprint should be repeated across at least the amount of work that you do should be repeated across all sites all across the United mm -hmm. States and I commend you guys for that effort that yeah. is awesome the iconography here is incredible and the story here at man at Moundville it is phenomenal uh, the story of the mound creation is is incredible to see but you can't can't get it unless you actually come here and visit and I really think you guys should come here and visit so we are gonna go check out some more features of this fantastic site one of the big questions that people get when they're out on sites like this is and they see all these mounds is, is where does the earth come from and there's several sources uh, including one like a feature we've got behind us uh, this is a looks like a little pond but it's called a, a borrow lake or burrow some people say it that way uh, and um, uh, it's not doesn't keep water in it all year long. If we have a hot, hot summer, it it it's dry and hard. Uh, but we believe that uh, they were removing some of the soil from some of these um, areas, and also the CCCs helped kind of smooth them out, especially the, uh, one of the big ones. Helped to expand it. To expand it because for years, you know, it's being plowed over and kind of ignored. And so they kind of help shape it, I guess you'd yeah. say. Um, but a borrow pit is where you borrow um, the soil from one place and do the other. So 
there were a lot of places. There was the gullies. There was th this whole area around here you could get. Um, so there wasn't. Uh, so there wasn't one central place where the earth was coming from. They were getting it from the gullies, the sides of, uh, of the bluff that we've got here from the pit like we have back here. And so dirt is coming from the surrounding area in order to construct all of these mounds. Yeah. And what's fascinating about this site is, is you had in the 1930s, you had the, the CCC come in and do work. The Civilian Conservation Corps come in and do work on these mounds and just went back to the borrow pit. <laughs> <laughs> to expand it and get more dirt and put it up. What's interesting is, is that you find these borrow pits on most Mississippian sites. What isn't known is whether these pits were left or whether they were utilized as a water feature on site or whether things like fish or turtles or games would have been put in there as a ready food source. So it's just a really interesting feature that you find on these Mississippian period sites. And, and one of them, they did find um, a copper, uh, uh, fish hook. Oh, that's cool. And so here. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so again the copper But it was being used as a fish hook. They also used bone uh, Too, but this this one was found here um, on this uh, site, but yes, it was they were going everywhere to get Get dirt. You know, yeah, yeah. I'd say. John go get a basket full. It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's your turn uh, So but the ball pits were an important thing but but they're not spring fed right they're, they're water fed mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's another one of the fantastic features that we have on this site so in the museum you guys have a lot of fantastic exhibits but you also have some portrayal both in art and in, in, in three dimensions what life would have been like during that period and behind us we have a person of some importance being carried on a on a litter on a on a big litter back there with retainers and the whole nine yards. How do we know that that scene took place? That they had litters? That they would have carried them in procession? Where where, where is the evidence for that? Well, one of it is coming from the Natchez Indians, okay. in Mississippi, and their their Mississippian style of life was still going on when the French come. And they do document uh, what they were doing, and they document some of uh, this scene of someone being carried on a litter of, of importance for something. This person here is being brought in uh, to marry the chief's son. And we talk to Native American groups. A lot of the natives helped us with this. We consulted with them all during uh, the making of this, that we're, we're doing it right and we're doing it to uh, show what the culture was like. Um, not only them, but all, all of us. So these warriors and the other um, mannequins that are here are all patterned after Native American people. Uh, that we, we, they came and had their um, uh, faces done. And so they're real people. And there's a couple of them that we know who they are, and we just I just say hey to them as we walk <laughs> But that's awesome that you've got documentation from the, the Natchez group, because they were the last people at contact who were still practicing as close to what was being practiced during the Mississippian, mm -hmm. during the Mississippian mm -hmm. period. So, so that was, and, uh, that was um, gave us, gave an idea of, of what this could be. And so how do you interpret that? And then um, what do you want it to look like and right. see? And so this is pretty spectacular. A lot of Native American artists helped with the um, uh, feather capes that are being worn, what she has. Uh, also, um, the, that feather cape took a long time to right. take. And the, some of the... Um, pieces that are in here too that are decorating the different um, mannequins who represent uh, the chief, his wife, his son who's going to be married, and the, we'll call him the medicine man, he has a rattlesnake disc in his hand and he is mixing paint up to paint um, the son up with before he meets his bride. Wow. The discs that are represented in here were used uh, as pallets. Uh, to mix paint for the warriors to wear 
for ceremonies that were being done, possibly. And um, so these are, uh, you can actually see some of the paint residue on a couple of these on the back. This looks like it's red ochre, possibly, because it's got that the color of ochre when you when you mix it up. And so um, these were uh, found here and in a fairly large amount. So it may be unique to here, but there's other cultures that may also have done something very similar to this. So they all have on their finest. The chief has on a turkey feather cap. They're real turkey feathers. Um, and then they also have colored feathers from like red birds and other birds uh, doing a design on the back of his cape. It's a beautiful cape. Uh, Mom is, is, looks like she's worried <laughs> or happy that her son is about to get married. And he is uh, being painted uh, for this ceremony and he has on all his finest things, uh, shell necklaces. So, so do uh, all of them have on shell bead nex necklaces, uh, copper, um, furs from animals, and uh, being highly decorated, even the front of his, um, he has on like a breech cloth, but this fr front part has been done long, and so it is also decorated with some very thin, fine copper. So this is a, uh, as a close of a look that we can get to what the people who lived here at Moundville would have looked like, what they would have dressed like, the things that they would have had, this is as accurate as a as a portrayal as we know of com compared to the research that's been done so far. And and this is also correlates with when Europeans come. Okay. Uh, and they 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 do see different groups and they talk about how they're dressed. Right. And so a, a breech cloth comes up between your legs and then part of it's long and and the front and the back. The women, uh, they say, were wearing um, uh, skirts that were finely made of Spanish moss. And uh, we forget it's hot here, and that would have been very, very cool. Uh, so they all have on their, their best that they have uh, to show their wealth, maybe, to show their power. Um, you know, everybody isn't dressed this way. And so this is also um, a way for them to say, look, look at us who we are i mean that's not what they but that's what it represents so the warriors that are bringing in the bride are worried they're not from here and so they have looks on their face like i don't know about this uh, but we're bringing her to to a marriage this is probably two groups that are now combining um through that marriage and so it would have been a ceremony that would have been held more than likely on top of Mount B um, for this particular ceremony. So when you come here to the site, you have an opportunity to see what they would have looked like in that period of time, which is another thing that makes Moundville an incredible site to come visit. So after extensive use of this site over a long period of time, this site falls into, into a decline, kind of towards the end of the Mississippian period, like all sites throughout the Mississippian world. But you've got one more feature on site that shows a continual occupation of the site, and they're not using the temple mounds uh, in terms of living on top of them, but they're living beside them in a separate fashion. And can you talk about that and the feature that's behind us? What we believe on this particular one is, is a, a group, a culture, uh, came here. Okay. And occupied, uh, started to occupy um, this, this mound behind us. It's a very low mound. So after the, the, the people that were here abandoned the site, you have another group coming in and reoccupying the site. What was the cause of the decline? Because, I mean, you've got a lot of great, I mean, you're, you've got mounds all over the place. I mean, you've got trade coming in from everywhere. What would cause the decline of people here? Well, 
One thing is diseases are coming in from European. Okay. So with that, and most of them are airborne, so we don't know if, if this is the beginning of it. If the leadership has collapsed, um, if the population is unhappy and they start going in small groups, uh, possibly what we now call clans, related groups would end up going um, leaving here and, and, and going somewhere else and beginning another life. But some still um, came, were brought back here uh, to be buried, not to be buried, but well, to be buried. And so they had a, um, a, a special place that these bones could stay until the time that their spirit could leave. Um, so this mound, different culture, it's very low. You think, you think that, you know, you can't fall off of it until you walk across it. And once you walk across it, you realize how high up it is. And in the center of it uh, was found a, um, a low, this lodge, this earth lodge, very low to the ground. The posts were found. The center post of it was found. The doorway of it facing east. Wow. And um, it had been, when it was, the time was over for them or whatever was going on, this structure was burnt. It was set on fire. Um, the only thing that was found on the, on the floor of this council, a lodge, was an upside down vessel, a beautiful strapped vessel. Strap means it has these little straps under the lip. And a small one, not a great big one, not decorated, but upside down. And in it was an acorn and some twisted cordage. Um, we'll never know for sure, but anthropologists back and forth, possibly it's a symbolism of new life with the acorn and a connection with Mother Earth because of the cordage, kind of like a navel. And the collapse of this building should have shattered that, but it didn't. Uh, and when, when we did the archaeology on it, it was, it was fascinating to see this one thing on the bare floor of, of an earth lodge that had been burnt. And such a poetic end to the story here mm -hmm. at this site, because, you know, not all civilizations last forever. Not all cultures, you know, will make it to the ends of time. Uh, even our cities like New York and Washington, D.C. will one day be abandoned. You know, stresses uh, come in from climate change and other other places, and it causes civilizations to collapse. And with the European contact and the diseases that came in started the collapse of the Temple Mound building cultures here and in other places throughout the United States. But what's fascinating is, is you have another group that's coming into this site building an earthen lodge back behind us here where they are still using this site as a mortuary for their, uh, for their fellow uh, people to be put into it. And then when that building is abandoned inside of it was placed a pot with a cordage and an acorn and as best as we can understand represent new life mm -hmm. that is such a poetic end to the history of this site this is a fantastic site thank you so much for showing us around for taking the time and explaining not only to us but to our audience the history here this is a site that's absolutely worth visiting we're just south of Tullahoma, Alabama, and this site is, is it Tullahoma? Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa. I'm sorry. That was Tennessean. We don't, it's Tennessean. <laughs> just south of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It's open uh, all year round, correct? Um, except for holidays, certain holidays. Except for holidays. What are your hours here? Uh, nine till um, four, four or, uh, for, and then at the museum closes at five. 
Okay, we'll have information at the end of this episode, but guys, this is definitely a site worth visiting as well as other prehistoric sites throughout the rest of the southeastern United States. I urge you to get out there and to explore this country's Native American past. And remember, history rocks. Is this a phone a friend moment? You got a phone a friend, did your friend know? <laughs> so this is a creation that the museum have come up with of, and, well, hold on, let me start that over again. It's okay, that's okay, that'll be a good blooper. We do bloopers, so that'll be, that'll be good.